Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode five of the Power of Witness series. Today on the hot seat, we have Laura and Casey. And if you have a chance and uh, want to go back and listen to their interview on our show, go back and listen to episode 105. It's not required before you listen to this episode, but it is helpful. And the other thing I want to mention, if you're brand new and this is the first Power of Witness episode you're listening to, go back and listen to episodes one, two, three, and four. It will help fill you in and give you more context for this whole series. And if you're looking for uh, any of the resources that get mentioned throughout this episode, either by Lauren Casey or by Catherine, or the resources that Catherine assigns to Lauren Casey, they will be in the show notes over at our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the resources tab, and you will find a link to Power of Witness. You will also be able to find it directly in your podcast player uh, show notes section. While you are there, I also highly recommend if you are interested in joining one of these uh, Power of Witness groups, they will be private. The the ones that Catherine runs, um, she's running one in February and one in March and beyond. Uh, but those are private. They will not be uh, they will not be publicized on our podcast. Uh, but if you are interested in signing up for those or learning more about them, there are links in the show notes as well to check out. And we highly, highly recommend it. Right. And I just I wanted to give just a little bit of an intro about this session with Laura and Casey. Um, first, you're, you'll laugh at how we all t- tend to get their names mixed up. We all wanted to call Laura Casey. Um, so listen for that. It's kind of funny. But this is an example of a session where so oftentimes when I'm working with couples, the relationship is my client and we are working on the dynamics of that client, which is the relationship, how they interact with each other. And then sometimes when I work with a couple, we end up focusing more on one person and the partner becomes a witness to that person. Sometimes an issue that one that one partner is dealing with comes to the forefront as as more pushy and in need of support. And so that happened in this session. It isn't what we meant to have to have happen. We had an idea about what we wanted to work on for them as a couple. But this other issue bubbled to the top and we went with it. And I think it's an example of how I try to have some structure and some idea of where we're going. But I truly believe in following the in Gestalt work, we call it the forefront. What is what is in your what is in your forefront? Where do we need to go? And in because of that, um, we all agreed at the end that it didn't feel as wrapped up cleanly and nicely as we would have liked it in 50 minutes. But that happens sometimes too. So again, this one really is an example of watching us roll with it in the moment. It is raw. It's real. We didn't edit it. We didn't go back and try to make it fit the model that we were hoping or how it fit with the others. Um, but I think you'll find that there's some some real, especially some um, great work that Casey and is going to launch into and giving Laura some help and support and how to, how to help him and support him in his work. Yeah. Yeah. A huge thank you to these two. They, you know, not that anybody else didn't who was part of this, but I, this one gets a little bit emotional and, and we just wanted to say thank you to them for showing up and being a part of the, part of the program Mm -hmm. and i think we can go ahead and jump in um okay so i was just reviewing our consult and um i've reviewed it before and felt like it was still pretty uh it was it was so broad enough and and specific enough at the same time that we didn't need to do a whole lot of rechecking in um i i I just i would love to think but doubt that um you guys like fixed codependency and you know, four weeks. Oh yeah. We yeah. I mean, we're good now. Good. Like, I mean, it's been four weeks, 20 plus years of codependency. I mean, it's like managed. Yeah. So we don't really have anything we need to talk about. <laughs> like a, a Monday morning. We just took care of it. Yeah. Let's just, let's just exchange sexy stories then. Forget about all this counseling stuff. So for an hour. Great. 
Um, all right. So I'll just give a little um, update everybody or let them kind of in on what we talked about. So um, basically what we agreed that we would talk about is um, the balance of autonomy um, and not in non-monogamy, how you all would like having this growing need for autonomy and, and wanting to stay in, in, in non-monogamy, but deciding how that would look like, what that would look like, especially kind of in the context of recovering as codependence. Mm-hmm. Right. And that yeah. this code, the codependency issues, autonomy issues, um, hit day to day life as well. Not just your non-monogamy journey. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I forget so, that this is you know, nodding. Doesn't yeah. Help. Nodding doesn't help. All right. I'll have to, I'll have to help you with that too. Um, so what we thought, what we had planned to do, if this still feels good is to ask you all to share a little bit about, your journey specifically with non, I mean, with, um, with codependency. So on the episode, we heard about your, your journey with non-monogamy, consensual non-monogamy. And, um, I know that there have been a few updates since your episode. So let's see, maybe let's do it this order. Why don't you share a little bit about what, sh- what shifted in your consensual non-monogamy journey since the episode, try to keep that really brief and then mm-hmm. give me a little bit of example of, your journey and understanding of your, of your flavor of codependency and how it pops up and what kind, what your hopes for with autonomy are. And then we'll kind of jump in from there. Okay. Should I go first? Oh yeah. (laughs) So I guess I'll just like recap the non-monogamy portion quickly. Um, Since I think the episode, we kind of ventured into potentially solo dating and actually not both of us, just Casey did. Um, because we thought that that may be like fulfilling for him or fun for him to do. It wasn't really anything I was super interested in. Um, so that happened. And then let me ask you real quick, if I can interrupt, what, what made you all come to the conclusion that that might be enjoyable for, or Casey, why did you think it would be enjoyable for you? Um, you know, I've always, well, I've been monogamous since my early twenties. Um, and even before that, you know, I think I was a monogamous, you know, long, long term, whatever, whatever like, serial term, monogamous, serial monogamous, <laughs> and, and you know, long term relationship. And you know, going into non monogamy, I kind of you know thought it might be nice to be able to enjoy some of the stuff maybe I didn't do as uh, while I was younger. Um, but I'm just you know I'm really not comfortable around women. Um, I, I and I think I understand that. Now, you know, I just need that extra connection I, I, to find someone, um, you know, that I'm interested in takes a time, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, um, it's not something that comes real easy. So, and I thought, well, maybe some of that is due to my insecurities and my just being uncomfortable around women. And maybe if I went out there and, and, and just tried it and mm-hmm. tried to meet people and, and create those relationships, um, that it would be helpful, uh, mm-hmm. for us and, you know, mm-hmm. And so I did that a little bit and I, you know, of course, navigated it completely wrong, you know, looking in hindsight, but you know, that's what <laughs> like we're what? doing. Um, just, I don't know, feeling somehow, I don't, I don't know. I, I felt guilt. I felt like what I was doing was not, um, you know, not that it wasn't ethical, but it, it was deep down. I think there was the feelings of this is, you know, this just isn't right. And I trying to not like hiding it from, from Laura. Um, and not, you know, she very much knew all about what was kind of going on, but trying, you know, not feeling comfortable sharing it, um, which kind of sent us down a path, I think, uh, which was not where we wanted to go. And that's kind of where we're not, it's not a part of us. It's not something we're doing as a team, whether or not she's physically there or, or not, it just wasn't something we were doing. Um, and that just didn't work out. And then of course COVID came. So that was a really easy way to like distance myself from, um, that relationship and, and unfortunately kind of just bury feelings around that and some other stuff came up and, and Laura will probably share. Um, it was just easier for me to just not deal with it because, you know, it's hard to deal with right now. It's not something that we can just go out and do. Um, mm-hmm. so it's been easy to just bury that. So, you know, that's, that was February, March. And so it's been a while that, that this, flavor of the codependency as, as weird its head, you know, uh, let me ask you, 
Okay. And let me ask you, is um, the easier to just bury it and ignore it? Is that a, is that a theme for you? Big deal. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so I am very much a path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. Um, if I can make someone happier, if someone, if I'm helping someone, that's really the, the big picture for me. You know, if I'm suffering, maybe it's not a big deal. I can deal with that. And, um, you know, if I can make them happy and get them, you know, uh, to not be a problem, I'll definitely do that. Okay. Um, All right. So pretty conflict avoidant people pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, even in, in life, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know. I think I, I kind of take that path and, and sometimes, you know, it's a huge benefit for me um, mm-hmm. in some of my adventures and things like that, but I can see how it also, it, it just creates longer term, bigger problems when mm-hmm. they're not faced. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't do it if it didn't serve you in some way, you know, I, yep. I really have that belief in, in us as, as adaptive, resilient, amazing beings that we don't pick yep. up a habit because it really sucks and it hurts us. <laughs> it helped you in some way, somehow. And yes, in this case, it helps you in the short term and what you, what yep. you get in the short term has a bigger pay later often. I never really much look forward that far. I mean. <laughs> right. Um, right. Which again, good things and bad things. Right. Okay. All right. So um, anything, uh, Laura, that you want to add to the non-monogamy update? Kinda. So we, we were going to go into the solo dating kind of as a quote unquote team. I know that that doesn't, I mean, we're going, going to go into him solo dating kind of as a team, um, which didn't really work great because our paces in life and our communication styles are like really different. So he asked me to not be involved with that for him because of his discomfort with like my pace and my, well, just the way that I am. So I said, okay, no problem. That's fine. And I didn't feel like bad about it. I just felt like that was his boundary and he was asking me to like respect that. And so that was fine. But then as it kind of continued, I think he had a lot of feelings surrounding that. And this is where I think that it really is feeling like, um, codependent in a not super healthy way. Like he had a lot of feelings that he asked for a boundary and that I respected it. And then he felt guilty for like not showing me things or not telling me things that I was kind of okay with that. And then more non-monogamy pieces came. We were kind of thinking about looking for a third person um, to join us. And so I got on um, dating apps um, to find a third person for the both of us, not, not really to do dating by myself. Cause it just isn't that a feeling and it wasn't at the time. Um, and it made him super uncomfortable, like within days. Uh, and, and he was like, this just is not going to work. And so I came up and instead of like hearing what was really happening, I think in the moment, I just felt like hurt, um, that he couldn't see that I was doing something for us. And also feeling like that's pretty codependent in a not healthy ish way. Mm -hmm. Um, So at that point we just like put a hundred percent stop to non-monogamy because really we just weren't on the same page ish anymore. It felt like, and that just felt too unsafe, you know? Mm -hmm. And so since then, um, we brought it up as a discussion between the both of us since then. And he um, continues to assert that we are just not in a healthy enough place in our relationship to explore outside of our relationship, which I can both respect, but also I don't have the same perspective on where we're at in our relationship. So to me, that sounds like he just doesn't want to deal with any, you know, baggage or crap that comes up when we do pursue non-monogamy and he wants to kind of stay with the normal and I mean I'm to me a relationship is feels solid ish you know it feels okay and so I guess that's where I want to find some sort of autonomy in each one of us feeling like we're a happy whole person and then we can come together in this relationship and have a meaningful connection together, but also feel happy 
whole and solid as a person to be able to explore outside of our relationship if it were something that came up. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And so um, that's a great summary. Casey, talk to me a little bit about what, how, what comes up for you with this idea of, of, of Laura's definition of autonomy, that each of you being healthy, whole people that can explore as you want. What, what comes up for you when you hear that? A lot of conflicting ideas on what that looks like to her. Mm-hmm. And really, I guess what the images that that conjures up to me. And, you know, it's, I, I think slowly I'm understanding a better idea of, of what she's looking for. Mm-hmm. And <sighs> trying to choose words. Um, I, I think I have a better understanding of that. And, you know, the way we've, we've lived has, you know, we've never been what I would, you know, a, a, I mean, of course we've had a solid relationship for 20 years, um, but we've always had, you know, the, the quarrels and the issues and, you know, um, you know very emotional. Um, our, our life is an emotional roller coaster. I yeah. mean, it has been. a lot of that has been, um, I think my, I think I've always battled with some sort of minor depression or something or, or, and I finally, you know, got some medical help for that, you know, about a year ago. And I think I've made some really big strides in just my personal emotional roller coaster. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so I, I think I'm able to, to kind of see what she wants, but at the same time, I think my insecurities, uh, just around myself, you know, I'm, I'm just, I think the, the fear of, of loss of losing her is still there, which, you know, it, it seems super far off to, you know, a rational me speaking to you and the world on a podcast. Um, you know, and I've done a little bit of thinking, you know, just, you know, since we've met, um, some of the ideas around all this kid talk about what we did when we were kids, I thought that was just crazy and, and it's funny because i'm still you know still like that's so long ago but still seeing like wow okay yeah some of the stuff i've always done my whole life and that's you know mm-hmm. half of least resistance um but i think you know there's always been something missing um or i feel with laura and the way that she you know her um what's it called love language and the way she she shares and gives and receives just relate, you know, um, emotions and, and care. Uh, and I feel like that something was missing and how, in, in how her? she shared it with me. Okay. I, I, I've always felt a very, um, I don't know, you know, like, how, you know, it's like compliments. She will never. I don't think I've given him more than five compliments in 20, 20 years. years. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, I don't, you know, I've learned to be okay with, I, I think I've, I've thought that I've learned to be okay with it, but I think, you know, it, it's just hard for me. So, so then when I see, you know, when she's messaging people or even like in-person flirting, I think it, it, it's sad because I see her, her doing, um, you know, grabbing somebody's arm or I, I don't know, compliment the way she, you know, it, it's the new, you know, you can't blame her. I mean, that's how you show somebody you're, you know, you like them, mm-hmm. but I think, there's some, you know, just emotions for me around that. When I see that, that's, I think, something I've wanted for 20 years and, mm-hmm. and never really received. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, when I see that, I think that's some of the, the instant gut-wrenching things, like, with the jealousy. Um, and, like, a girl on Tinder or whatever app is insane, you know. So I've been on there a couple, you know, a month before uh, Laura probably signed up. And, you know, I got... I'm a decent looking guy. I got five or six people maybe messaging me throughout that time and nothing's ever, you know, nothing ever transpired. And she signs up for a day and, you know, she's got like 900 guys, you know, <laughs> just, and, and so that too, like, you know, I'm not one of a kind. There's, there's a ton of great people out there really. And so feeling, there's a lot of feelings there. Um, and I know that's something, you know, I really need to work on. But again, with my personality, COVID, 
it's been so easy to just plow the, that path of least resistance and shut down. Um, but I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. I'm trying. Okay. I don't know if any of that makes sense. Oh yeah, that helps. Um, so, so it's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as as you all, as I've said to you all, I throw noodles against the wall. I, I don't know what's going to stick. But one of the things I'm wondering about is it. This may sound crazy, but Casey, it almost sounds like you're pretty comfortable with the codependence the way it's been. Like that, maybe there isn't a lot of motivation for you to change that. Am I hearing that? Okay, just so everybody knows, like Laura's about to nod her head off. Um, she's head banging. <laughs> she's head banging in the nodding. <laughs> but There's, but I'll, so Laura definitely agrees with those noodles. How does that feel I'll, for you, Casey? You know, I think that really is the narrative. You know, happily ever after. And you know, you see, you know, I grew up with the great, you know, watching Brady Bunch. It was well before my time, really. But I don't know why I like, I love the corny shows and I don't know all those sitcoms and, and even in um, my mom and dad's relationship, um, you know, it was very much, you know, the, the man makes decisions and, and I don't even want that, but it's, I, I guess it's more of, um, I don't know, the, the submissiveness act, the, the there for your husband, that's your job. Um, and, and, you know, it kind of hurts to say that because I'd like to think, you know, I'm progressive and, and I don't think our relationship has any of that. Well, it really doesn't. But, I make the decisions and you follow them, but <laughs> I don't know if it goes like that. Either. Calm Pretty down. close. <laughs> I'm easy going. Um, but so I think some of that narrative is, is super ingrained in my head. Um, and, and I think the need for me to to feel, you know, pond after or, um, you know, sought, sought, um, is something, you know, I've probably built up an unhealthy need for that. Um, you know, and Laura has been telling me this for years and, you know, we've talked about how, you know, we, I need to understand that, you know, I cannot expect or look for someone else to fill any voids. Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of my responsibility to, to figure that out. Um, so I understand, yeah, it's, that's not how I want to feel, but I would say there is a little bit of me enjoying that code of art or, you know, getting some fulfillment out of it, I guess. Um, okay. That's an, that's a brave admission. Um, that's why I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to stick or not, but, um, you know, again, sort of like with Jack, it's it's brave to admit the um, the ways patriarchy has served, and this way, the codependency is serving you in some ways, and it's status quo, and there's comfort, and it's it's easier, and um, and so being able to serve that, I think it, it it touches on some of that other stuff we've talked about. With first, we have to look at what what these how it serves us before we can ever think about letting it go. Right. So let me ask you, Casey, before I, I've been focusing on you a little bit and I'm going to get you off the hot seat in a second, but do you see ways that it either isn't serving you or it isn't serving your relationship? And we won't go to like necessarily how it isn't serving Laura yet, but is there, are there any ways that you see that your codependency, codependent ta- tendencies aren't serving you or not serving your relationship? It's definitely not serving my relationship. Uh, I, I guess, and in, in here's me, is I'm always thinking of, of how it's not serving her or other people. Um, it, it serves me at, I think, sheer comfort um, and, you know, uh, a false narrative, you know, that I, I kind of grew up with. Um, when you say false narrative, do you think it's like false sense of security narrative? Yeah, a little bit of that. Um, maybe, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, to have, it's the relationship, you know, I, I thought I always wanted. And, you know, that's what you do to be happily ever after. You, you find a, a girl or, you know, a partner and you get a house and you have kids and, and you know, she come home and you have a nice warm dinner cooked and, um, and people, but, but at the same time, you know, but I fed this. 
for because you twenty that's years what I really... because I also thought that that's what was an expectation. That's what that you wanted. That's what I thought was safe and happy. I mean, we both built that. It wasn't yeah, easy. No, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot. I mean, and and so many people, and, and we're st- and and what's funny is this progressive and and crazy as we are, you know, even in thinking of non-monogamy, mm-hmm. um, you know, we still have these, you know, um, narratives that are still pretty ingrained in our heads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, but the question of how yeah. it isn't serving you. It's not serving me because it's pushing my partner away and, you know, uh, has, has caused a lot of friction in, in closing all the doors that we can have open, you know, to fulfilling us. Um, you know, I mean, we can be, we can have some really great times. Um, and, and the best times to me are when we're the most vulnerable and and just, I don't know, able to freely and discuss things in a, in a very mature manner, uh, and not childish and arguing and and yelling or Um, hiding, burying or hiding. Yeah. And I do a lot of hiding. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's forcing us further apart. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, that's sad and scary, uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you've got an internal battle between comfort, old narrative, um, going back to that unconscious commitment to this ingrained narrative that you have this unconscious commitment to avoiding or uh, the path of, excuse me, the path of least, least resistance, avoiding conflict. This is easiest uh, to, to continue. I know what that path is. Mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Mm-hmm. That's um, okay. But yeah, I know I, I've been down that road. I know what it is. I know I can manage and live and I will still be alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other path is, is kind of more unknown. It's going to trigger me to, to have to deal with these emotions, to, mm-hmm. to talk about them, mm-hmm. to, just to figure them out. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it is easier the other way. And I mm-hmm. think that's probably my biggest um, hurdle at, at making any progress. Well, and I also think your wording is setting you up that this, the path of codependent monogamy is how I'm going to kind of call that path is easier because you won't is, is easier. And then you say, mm-hmm. because of blah, 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 blah. Yep. But it has a big cost and it may not be easier because it may get you another two years of what you've got <laughs> or, yeah. or what parts either one of you would have to deaden in order to stay on that path. People often, you know, who are not in non-monogamy and who, at, who find out that I am and ask me about it, they'll be like, oh my gosh, but isn't that so hard? That sounds so hard. And I'm like, what you're doing is hard too. One isn't better than the other. And I don't, I don't have an agenda about which one you do, but don't trick yourself into thinking one's easy. That's like, you know, drives me crazy when people think that giving kids goldfish is a healthy snack. I'm like, it's, it's junk food. It, it's delicious junk food and enjoy junk food all you want, but don't think you're giving your kids carrots. Like just know what you know, what you're getting into. So when you say this other path is easier, I'm going to challenge you on that because as long as you're using that word easier, your lizard brain is going to be like, go with that one. Cause the lizard brain wants you to re- preserve all your resources. Don't run. Cause a bear might chase you later. You got to be rested. Always choose the easier one. Rest when you can rest, eat as much as you can, when you can eat as much as you can. So as long as you're using that word easier, do you see how there's, it's going to be really hard to get the part of your brain yeah. that needs to be online in alignment with this. You make it sound so simple. No, well, I don't mean to make it sound simple, but, but does no, that no, but it does. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you tell yourself, you know, the, freaking fish crackers taste way better than a Mm -hmm. carrot. I mean, of course you're going to say, I want some fish crackers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, that, that that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that probably goes a lot with what Laura tries to, um, help with. And that's, you know, re rewriting that narrative or that internal monologue. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, not, not, or I guess, Yeah, I think it's maybe just making sure that you're looking at 
right more thing. realistically, what about each path is easy and what, uh, what about each, each path is hard? Or maybe we stop using hard and easy. We use pro con. We use, what do I get from this? What do I get from this? <laughs> Cause I just, yeah, I, again, this whole idea of like, oh, well, non-monogamy is hard and monogamy is easy. Bullshit. I mean, monogamy is really hard, too. And oh, it's just yeah. which and one that, do you want to choose? And when I say this path is easier, mm-hmm. I, I even say this path with non-monogamy. But the path that I know, the path that I have ventured on before, even if it is just, you know, single guys every now and then mm-hmm. or, or or just what I what I've known. Like, I've done that. I know that that's safe and that works. Um, and yeah, that feels the, the simpler, or easier way. Mm-hmm. Um, but even that, I guess, you know, I've you know, it's been really shut down and I still would have to really figure out, you know, it, it's been so long since we've had to have any non-monogamy discussions. That, um, mm, okay. Let's chat. Tra- let's challenge those words. It's been so long since we've had to have any non-monogamy conversations. Me, I'm like, Oh, it's been so long since we've gotten to have any, like, <laughs> Right. I mean, and I don't. To me, Mm -hmm. I appreciate non monogamy conversations and discussions because I feel like he's more open and interested in engaging with me because he wants to be open and engaging with me because that's how we both are able to achieve consensual non monogamy because we're engaged and participating. But if we don't have any discussions and if it's 100% shut down, then we don't have conversations that are deep and meaningful surrounding what we want. And then we get into a place where he tells me we are not having any intimacy and we're not connecting. Mm -hmm. But he had then previously said, do not bring these things up to me because it makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to talk about them. And so then I feel like I'm really stuck in a way with, we can't explore this we can't explore this. And that means we're not having these deep discussions, but that means that we're not having the type of intimacy that he asked for. Mm -hmm. See how that would be frustrating. Do you miss, do you see the connection with having non-monogamous conversations and feeling more, um, feeling deeper levels of intimacy and wait, let me make sure. When I say the word intimacy, I'm not talking about sex. Yeah, I know. Sex is we one know. of the ways we can get into me, have intimacy into me see, but just want to double check that we're using it the same way. So, mm-hmm. so Casey, do you notice the difference when you're not having these conversations in, in, do you see the correlation in, in the, the, in not getting that intimacy? You know, I think it's one way that I see, intimacy was through, you know, in the past was definitely, you know, I really enjoyed really just talking a lot about too, like that, that to a certain extent, you know, really was very fulfilling for me. Um, and you know, I could, to, to me, it was, you know, I mean, if we had, if we were monogamous for this entire year, I don't think I would still ever consider myself monogamous. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at any at, you know, for any length of time, I, I think I'm always open to the idea of something that feels good. And I know she's biting her tongue over here, <laughs> um, but that's like my pace. And so, yeah, I would use that for connection, but I think it comes up or brings back to, you know, the, the way that she likes to share her love and caring feelings and, and receive them and how I like to get them and show them. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, I felt, I feel like there, it's lacking for me in some ways. So when I'm able to have a, a, a very engaging, deep conversation with somebody that is very fulfilling, like that kind of feeds some of that need for intimacy. Mm-hmm. Um, so is, are there different things that you're wishing or wanting to be talking about that would create this deep, um, this deep feeling of intimacy with Laura that you're just feeling like she's not open to, or she's not willing I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, she holds a lot of probably frustration and hurt from, you know, the way I reacted, um, you know, when we kind of closed the door for a little while. And, and when I say we closed the door, I don't think any one of us thought it was going to be COVID and 
just mm-hmm. keep rolling into months on months on months. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, so when we kind of took a step back, um, you know, that was a huge, that was a, you know, that was a pretty bad moment in our, probably one of the worst moments we've had in our you know, 20 year history, um, mm-hmm. where I was very concerned that, that I, I don't know that we had just changed, um, that there was, you know, that that was a really big deal. The way I blew up, the way she handled it, the way I handled it. Um, and yeah, I don't know if we've actually ever really recovered from that because we've kind of just because you buried it buried have, you, it. have you talked about how it went down when you uh, when Laura's you tried I've been really I don't yeah since I have not dealt with it I have not been very on board with the idea I do you know I know I have struggled in our relationship for the last year, feeling like we have really been connected. Um, so like the idea to try to navigate some other, you know, it, it just difficulty, it seems overwhelming. Um, you know, we've got COVID and kids school and, and, you know, working from home and dealing with us and then to like want or have the energy to want to delve into that is scary. Um, you know, I'm probably using that as kind of a shield. It's just, well, Hey, it's COVID. You can't do this. Uh, but she's brought it up. Um, and unfortunately our conversations always end up, you know, like a lot of our hard conversations lately. And that's, you know, with us being very defensive towards each other and being, uh, you know, just a lot more emotions, you know, not super fighty or anything, but just definitely not open and, and caring like it should be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I want to just make a little space here. Um, this one's going to be tough because where I really want to go is I want to I really want to open up that conversation a little bit and let you all try to have it with some support. Um, I'm nervous about our time for that. And I'm also nervous about if we, if you all have the kind of going back to David and Amanda's, the, the scaffolding, the safety the safe space that you, that you may need to be able to do that. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe what I want to do is, is back up a little bit. And for for one thing, I want to, Laura, I want to give you a little space to fill in and talk about anything that's, that's pinging for you. Um, But I'll also say, if you all feel safe and want to jump in and try to have some of this conversation about how the door closed, we can do it. We may not, we may have to stop it a bit abruptly depending on time, but what, what feels Laura, what feels for you? I mean, I feel safe to talk about any of these things. I feel, I feel safe and comfortable in our relationship. Like I feel like I feel solid in our relationship. So I feel totally safe to talk about whatever issues arise. Um, I have approached the subject with Casey more than once, a lot of times, and I don't, he thinks that I'm asking the questions to get a specific response, but I'm really asking the questions so that we can get it all out and then just like move through it and move forward with it. I don't respect shoving it down and and just ignoring it and thinking it will be different because in my own history, that's not how things change. <laughs> mm-hmm. Things change because I bring them up. I show them to the light. I look at them and I say, wow, this is totally not what I want. How does this become different? It becomes different because I make specific changes with my own body and my own mind. And then I move forward in a different way. But if I continue to do the same patterns all the time, I don't make meaningful change in my own life. And to me, non-monogamy isn't the the end point. Isn't like all the parties in Mexico every fifteen minutes. Like the end point to me is full, happy human people living their true life meanings in the world. Mm-hmm. So I'll just say that, and then sure we can move into what happened at that closed the door. Well, okay. So let me check in with you. Does that, does that feel safe to, 
to jump into that a little bit? I mean, really, I, I feel very safe. I haven't felt unsafe anything I've shared so far or anything you've said. Um, that doesn't, you know, I want to make sure, one, that there's an appointment that the podcast mm-hmm. works. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that's important. But, mm-hmm. a, again, there's me. Um, I know I can handle any feelings and emotions that come up in my own way. I know I'll be okay. So if you think there's time and we and this would be beneficial for um, people to hear, <laughs> um, you know, I'm all for it. I'm not. Okay. I don't, all right. Yeah. Well, I just, I mean, that's the, that's what it, to me, it sounds like we're all in agreement that 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 needs to happen, that like this, that you've, you've come to the table bravely admitting that your tendency to bury and uh, make excuses for not talking about the difficult things is not serving your relationship, not serving you overall. Um, And you're missing intimacy and connection. Um, I'm sure you all, I imagine you all are familiar with Brene Brown. Yes, not I in am. here. So one of my favorite Brene Brown sayings is that you don't get to selectively numb. So, you know, Casey, you saying, well, let's not talk about this because there are all these other things to deal with. Oh, let's keep this hard thing buried. Let's numb this part. That numbness eventually takes over everything. And so it also numbs, it's going to numb your ability to really receive and feel joy and receive and give love. Um, be open to intimacy, receive a partner's desire for intimacy. And it feels like maybe that's what's happened is like, Oh, let's not talk about this because there's COVID. And, but then now not feeling as close to each other as you'd like to. Oh, for sure. I think, you know, in, in the same way that, you know, I discussed before, like some of the ways I feel like I don't get it. I know like even, you know, through sex is, is huge. Like that's, that's, I'm able to recharge a lot of my bank mm-hmm. um, from that. Um, so I, you know, definitely choose that as a path for our connection, mm-hmm. which is great. I choose it too. Oh yeah. I choose it too. Okay. All right. So let's, let's jump in. Let's talk about what, what this, this conversation that you've been avoiding about how, how this went down, what went down. You guys will know better what that looks like than I, than I will, but let's give me the, give me the skinny and well, Maybe I'll just go from my perspective what happened first. I don't know if it's best, but so my perspective was um, well, what like just was the straw that broke the camel's back, I feel like, was that um, Casey was having a very emotional day. Um, he had set up a, a date outside of our a date oh, with yeah, somebody was, else. Yeah. yeah. I don't like even think he remembers. He's so forgotten about it. It was the third day and He was like feeling a lot of pressure from this other person. Actually, it was not even pressure from the other person. I feel like it was just pressure in his own brain Mm -hmm. that there was going to be some sort of sexual expectation at that day. And um, that was the same week as that I got on the apps and there were 900 dudes messaging me and he was like kind of freaking out. And uh, I was like, dude, if you're freaking out, let's just shut it down. Like no big deal. We can revisit this later. Like I was truly open to that. I wasn't feeling resentful or holding on to feelings about that. I was feeling fine with it. And he says to me, well, okay, yeah, let's shut it down. I'm feeling really upset about it. I'm also feeling just super upset about this date. I don't think I really want to date this person. I think on this date, I'm going to just tell her I don't want to date her anymore. And I was like, cool, but you could probably just do that via text and not like drive for 45 minutes to do that, but whatever. And he's like, no, I think I need to do it in real life. Blah, blah, blah. No problem. I was like, okay, cool. Well, have fun on your date. Hopefully it goes super smooth. And I know that sounds like I'm being flippant, but truly I felt like that's how I was. Yeah. Dating. I mean, there was no, I wasn't feeling like we weren't that. Like when I left, I felt at least kind of okay. Yeah, you felt kind of okay ish. Multiple hours went by with no call or text from him. So I was like, I wonder like how it's going. So then I like texted him, no response. Texted him again, no response. Called him, no response. And at that point, I was just kind of like freaking out Mm -hmm. because he says, I'm going to go meet up with this chick and just tell her no thank you. And I, I mean, I wasn't truly invested in that. I didn't really care, but. Usually if I text and call him, he like responds. Mm -hmm. So by the time an hour later, he gets 
back to me. He's like, I left my phone in the car. And I was like, well, what did you do for three hours if you weren't just saying, no, thank you. I don't want to date you anymore. And he was like, oh, well, some stuff happened and it went good and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, but if you can't even be honest with me, like, I'm going to go break up with this chick, but really I'm going to go like do sex up with this chick. Like, what the hell? I was livid. Mm -hmm. Not about the act. I didn't really care uh, or about anything. I was so angry that he wasn't honest with me mm-hmm. about his intentions. And so, well, wait, 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 at this point, did you know that he wasn't honest about his intentions or that's just what you were you were saying? Oh no, that's what was my narrative in my own mind. Mm-hmm. In I think I mind, also, the, like when I talked to you, it was over the phone, you know, when I did see that he was told, I think <laughs> You know, I shared complete, you know, what had happened. Oh, yeah. He wasn't dishonest when he called me back. Mm-hmm. He was honest when he called me back and said, hey, this is what really happened. I didn't say I didn't want to see her anymore. I just did sex stuff with her and then drove home. I just left my phone in the truck. And I was like, okay, well, that makes me really angry that you told me one thing and did another. Mm-hmm. And I think is what made me so angry is because I feel like I'm very like an open book with him and my feelings and my intentions. And I felt like he wasn't respecting me the same mm-hmm. respect. Let and me, also, also- mm-hmm. in the same day is when he said, you are not allowed to go on apps and talk to dudes because I'm uncomfortable with it. And I'm like, so you can be doing whatever you want with whoever and not even telling me that you're doing it, but I'm not even allowed to set up a third for our relationship. Mm-hmm. It, the power imbalance felt so huge that I just like lost my marbles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt. And when you say you lost your mar- marbles, what that looked like? Oh, I was just raging out. Mm-hmm. Like I was so, I remember being so angry that I was like ill, physically ill. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and he knows this as he's driving back. Oh, I'm sure. Oh yeah. I mean, it, yeah. And that's what I mean by codependent because, or, or emotionally so interconnected that he couldn't separate the fact that I was so angry about the honesty or the lack of just to me felt honesty and the act of with that woman. I don't think he could separate that. I think he just felt like shame that he did that with the woman, mm-hmm. even though I really just felt angry about the lack of transparency it felt like to me. Mm. Okay. I don't see that as codependent. Um, I think that your reaction to it feels pretty normal and natural because you heard one thing happened another. I also want to point out that when we have a period of time where we don't have predictable contact with our partner, the way we're used to, and all the alarm bells go off to about like, did he actually make it there? Is he dead in the ditch? Is she a serial killer? Is blah, 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 blah. I don't know if your brain goes there, but I think, I know mine does. Oh, yeah. I think as oh, yeah, mine mind. does. So, so it's like, the, if you want to see me lose my marbles, it's worry me for no reason. Right. Hell has no fury. It has that, I know. Right? And I was so excited later. I was so excited that he was able to have this interaction with another person because to me that was so fulfilling in my previous interactions with other people. So I was actually excited for him that he was able to successfully interact with this other person, but it was just the the rage had taken over before I was able to even really experience that. Mm -hmm. And and in all fairness, I mean, that was not my first mistake navigating that this new you know and, and it was probably the biggest but it, it was just constant mm-hmm. uh, my inability to feel like i could navigate that well say um, say that more clearly like how would you what do you think you did how could you have navigated it better so you know i I think I feel so insecure about making bad decisions or saying something stupid or making an ass of myself. With Laura or with other people? People in general. With mm-hmm. Laura. Well, I, I guess I just fear what, you know, how that looks for Laura when I make an ass of myself. Um, mm-hmm. But so I thought it would be, it would feel safer for me only because it was easier to, to not 
include her, not to have her see every text that I send and not to be so much a part. So that if I fuck it up, I can be like, Oh, she just ghosted me and no big deal. Not like to your husband's a, a weirdo and uh, you know, whatever. I, I'm not a weirdo. I know I'm pretty normal, but it was so, it was easier for me because if it didn't work, the only judgment I had to face was my own, not Laura's where she's like, well, what do you mean? You couldn't get down in this girl's pants. Not that she would ever say that, but, but it's easier when only I have to know that truth, I guess. So, so if I felt like it was safer, if I not hit it, but just didn't include her as much. And then we, you know, we decided like, okay, well maybe like every, you know, whenever you want, just tell me and you can look through my messages. Mm -hmm. And that was like such a cringy thing. And it kind of, you know, it really sparked emotions in Laura Mm -hmm. and, um, but she was able to, you know, navigate those feelings in a, in a mature way. Let me, let me start Um, with one second. Casey, did you share with Laura what, where that, like where that was coming from that that you just shared the bit about Mm -hmm. so worried that you thought that you look like an ass? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said that the reason why he didn't want to show me his phone is because he doesn't like it when I correct his spelling and grammar (laughs) and generally say, you should have done it different or I am judgy. I am judgy and he doesn't appreciate my judgments because he feels like every judgment is a criticism. Well, so if I can, yeah, the, uh, some of that is also pace. I, you know, it feels bad to always be the break. Mm -hmm. I'm always the break. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, bar maybe the first, experience we had um and you know so many opportunities or whatever you want to call it where i know laura was fully on board and i wasn't and and that's you know kept her from having fun or whatever when i I know she's fine with but it hurts to always be the break she's always had a faster comfort level and you know i didn't want to have to worry about going at her pace well like so mm-hmm. some of it yes yeah, some judgment but also like don't push me i i'm not comfortable this whole thing is uncomfortable um wait there feels like this this one part that feels really important that that yes pace and and judging about grammar and stuff but it sounds like there's this insecure part that i just want to like scoop up that's about worrying that something like if you do something and the other girl doesn't like you that it won't like that it would make you less attractive in Laura's eyes. I think it's just an insecure personality that I've had. I think sure. I've always been afraid. I mean, everybody's afraid of, of you know, rejection. Um, but I mean, yes, I am very insecure around, you know, the opposite sex and you know, people I'm interested in. It's really easy. You know, she gets, you know, Laura gets a little frustrated because I spend a lot of time, you know, we go to a club or do something. I'll spend a lot of time talking to somebody who she knows is, is I have zero interest in, in sexually. And it's easy because I can talk and talk and talk for hours with these people. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's a little harder. So I think a lot of my feelings revolve around my insecurity. And that's okay. I just want to make sure that that's separate from the like judging and the pace. Those, those feel like they need to be separate and that that one part, especially sounds really young, or a young part or, or old in your life. Um, and a part that. Hmm. Need, mm, need some. some reassurance. And honestly, I think it's going to need to come from you, Casey, Laura, you certainly could help uh, help some with, sh- with sharing this to adult Casey. But I think that you are going to have to speak some of that to that part of, you know, if some other woman thinks that I, that I'm a dork and, and ghosts me, Laura's not going anywhere. She has chosen us and chooses us every day and, and opening my, opening myself up to rejection to another person isn't going to affect how Laura feels about me. Which is true. Yes. Because that just, I mean, until you face that part and soothe that part, it's going to be really hard for you to not 
hide and try to only give her the highlight reel. Like you can't like give. The thing that all the of course, <laughs> like, <it is. laughs> you can't yeah. give you can't give Laura the Facebook feed. Like she needs to see the the good, the bad, the ugly, and that your shit stinks and love you anyway, which she has shown she's that that she's done. But we got to get this other this other part this part of you that somewhere at some way in this somehow in this way doesn't believe that she will. Like if she almost, it almost is like, tell me if this sounds right. It's like, oh gosh, if she sees, if Laura sees me through the eyes that these other women see me through, she's going to realize that she, that she shouldn't be with me. And it's like an imposter syndrome. I don't know if any of this is landing, but is any of that. I would just replace her and women with everyone. (laughs) Sometimes. Yeah. I think his perspective is very much that if people find out, about him as a person truly, then they won't want to be with him. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So I, I just think that I, I can't build that in him. Mm-hmm. That's my issue is that I can build that in myself, but I can't build that in him. Mm-hmm. So that does feel like hard for me because I'd love to be able to, build that for him but well let me say this i don't when we talk about like whole and separate people like individuated people that is definitely a goal but that doesn't mean that you're not whole individuated people in relationship so i would say that i wouldn't just wash your hands of it laura and be like well that's yours have fun with that like you there is stuff you can do and i will say that I think you were, you were wise to realize that at the end of the day, yes, it is Casey's job. It is his, they're, they're his parts to soothe and it needs to be some alignment with his parts. And I would say that my guess is words of affirmation are pretty important to you, Casey. Yeah. Right, whole compliment thing. Some sort of like clear, simple, a uh, child able to understand <laughs> repetitive mantra. My mantra is repetitive, right? Yep. Um, you know how your kids, you guys have little ones, you know how they want you to read the same freaking book every night, you go to the library and you get like 15 new books, mostly because you're excited. You can read something new and you're like, can we read the bunny book again? And you're like, Fuck no, right? Oh, you know yeah. why? Here's my take on it. Every day, these little kids have so much new stuff coming at them. There's so much they don't know. There's so much that's unpredictable. There's so much that's out of their control. But you know what is in, under their control? What happens in that bunny book? You know what's predictable? What happens in that bunny book? How you say the characters' names, how you personify them. There is such a comfort to that repetition and that predictability that soothes mm-hmm. a really, that, that soothes their little brains at the end of the day, when they're, when they are just raw from how much they've been exposed to in that day. So if mm-hmm. we think about that, we all have a little kid about that age, still running around in our skin, in our psyche. And when that part gets raw, when that part, and I'm going to say it like for Casey believes that he's like the wizard of Oz. that if anybody really saw that, he's just some middle-aged bald dude behind the curtain that nobody would believe in Oz anymore. And so he has to bellow and, you know, like try to try to deflect and whatever, like when there's the, the rawness and the exhaustion that must come, that comes when, with that kind of imposter syndrome and that kind of insecurity, there's a really raw nerve that could be pretty easily, not easily soothed. Um, a pretty easy thing for you to do to support might be something simple and repetitive that he can count on. And you guys can work out what that might be. Um, you could say it all day long until you're blue in the face and exactly the script he wants you to say it. And you're right. If he isn't at the same time doing this inner part alignment, it will bounce off. It will mean nothing. But it doesn't mean you couldn't help in that way. Right. Okay. Casey, how does that sound as I say that to you? Does that feel like that could be helpful? You know, I know a lot of my just life issues revolve 
around, you know, some uh, insecurities, but I just, I don't know. I, it, it hurts when I hear Laura has to put more work in or more effort because I think she has to put in a ton of effort every day to, to play the person that she thinks I want her to be. And, you know, that's taxing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I know I'm not the easiest person to, but I'm a grown a person that can make Make choices about how to do my own life. And if my life says, I want to show up in this way for my partner and be here every single day and continue to build this life together, then that's on me. (laughs) It's not your responsibility to opt me out. Because I'm and that's where up. the codependency that is. is codependency, yes. So, so that is what I'm seeing some light to um, the more we have these discussions. But can I also point out that you you going to I just hate for Laura to have to do this extra thing. I'm already a hard person to live with. Do you hear how that is like it? It feeds that narrative that that the yep. it's it's like uh, sadly how familiar is comfortable even if familiar is toxic yep right yeah so even that it's like oh no don't do that because it's like you have found a way to now switch this way this this offering i've given her to support you you then just went right ahead and switched that into instead of hearing this mantra i'm just going to see that it's yet another thing she has to do because i'm such a burdensome person so right away, you're ready to deflect that love she was willing to give you. Yeah. We're, getting, we're getting nods um, over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's a podcast. And, and <laughs> in a lot of ways, that, you know, probably is, is how, you know, I move through life. Mm-hmm. And that's a little bit, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, you know to just see that and you know I know I joke about it a lot and um, you know I try to bring some you know sense of comfort to that Mm -hmm. but it it happens like right then when I just you know I don't even think about it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah okay so I also wanted to um, share this is actually something I shared with Jack and Jill um on the last uh, power of witness that they were part of this idea of a, of a pond um, is your relationship and you each have a boathouse on either side. And most of the time you get in your boats and you paddle to the center and you circle around and it's lovely and you have your little thing. And then you're back to your purse, to your individual boathouses. And it's usually you meet in the middle. Right. And then there are times when one of you has got the flu and you, paddle all the way over and you bring them soup and then you paddle back and you do all the things that it takes to paddle there and back and you take care of your boathouse. And while you're over there, you clean her boathouse too. Amazing. And then, you know, another time somebody's, you know, Casey's parents sick. I don't know. And so Laura says, no problem. I'm going to paddle all the way over and I'm going to take care of yours while you're taking care of theirs. No problem. And that is the nature of a committed relationship. A lot of the times it's 50, 50, a lot of times it's 90, 100, but then the next time it's 90, 100 flip the other way. And I think that it is often very hard for us. I think it's often harder for us to sit in the boathouse and watch our partner paddle all the way over than it is for us to get in our boat and paddle all the way over. Oh, of course. Right. And I will say that the, the like really true, deep exhale, knowing that we are loved we're seen and we're heard and we're understood and we're loved anyway comes from being able to sit and watch our partner paddle all the way over and realize like just what Laura said, they are a grown ass person who chooses to do this. They're not like, you stupid. I got a goal in there. <laughs> it's a gift to be able to love someone like that. Very much so. We have to clean our boathouses. Let's say it this way. We have to clean our boathouses to be able to sit on the shore and watch the beauty of that gift of our partner paddling toward us. And what does cleaning our boathouses mean? Hmm. Working on believing that we are worthy of this 
understanding the parts of us that are scared to believe we're worthy of this, that alignment of all of these parts. Let me back up and say, Casey, this isn't necessarily about like you going back and like healing something that happened a long time. Like these parts are alive and well right now. They're in you right now. Like they are, they are informing your narrative. They're informing your actions, your motivation. So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to, I don't want to have to go back to 1986. I'll, I'll just stay here. Yeah. No, 1986 is right here with you. It's already here. So you can think that you don't have to go back there, but until you acknowledge that they're there and you get everybody working on the same team, everybody's running in a different direction and your boathouse is a hot mess. That it is. <laughs> you see my shop? <laughs> I want a magic button. Yeah. Um, Wouldn't that be nice? But no, it, it's just, yeah. I mean, that's something that has been, has been brought up in the past and it's just, that's, I don't know, I think probably the most typical thing for me to try to work on. You know, I've worked mm-hmm. on so much this past year, but I, and I've even, you know, thought of this before, how I really have not dealt with that. And, um, because it's, it's a very scary thought. It's, it's, and so it is a scary thought. Dealing with it. I, I think dealing it's with me, um, just my feelings of, of insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I know that, I mean, you know, like I said, if I'm talking to you and everybody mm-hmm. else, it, I, I can see, like, I know I'm, I'm a good person. I have mm-hmm. my, my good things and my bad things, just like everybody else. Um, but, but that underlying feeling, that imposter feeling, the, the Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz, where I'm always, I don't know, I'm afraid if people actually see who I really am, mm-hmm. then they won't want to hang out or whatever. And I, you know, I, yeah, so I mean, unfortunately, I don't think this is where any of us thought this mm-hmm. this conversation would go. Mm-hmm. I was hoping you were going to tell Laura that I was doing so many things awesome. Oh, <laughs> She she did say you yeah, were doing so many things I'm awesome at joke. some point, yeah. mm-hmm. and then you know, you know we'll all do awesome stuff together. Mm-hmm. I have stuff in the stuff in my boathouse that needs to get cleared out, so and we I'll all just have continue to work on it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, but I'll, and the other thing is scary to deal with my feelings of insecurity. Again, I would bet that there's some part of you that's like, oh, it'll be easier if I don't deal with my insecurities. And again, I want to challenge that, that word and say, yep. you not dealing with your insecurities is creating this whole other mountain of, of trouble. Right. And so that, it's like, that really hit when you, when you said easy, because it's not easy. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course it's easy. I don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. And I, I can live with all the emotions because I think I've lived with them for long mm-hmm. enough. But does our day to day feel easy? No, no it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It, doesn't it doesn't feel, feel healthy. Easy. It, it doesn't feels feel easy. Healthy. It feels uh, consistent and mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of like the, the chi- ch- child's book. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's it's that's what happened yesterday. It's easy. You know, we've dealt with these emotions before. Mm-hmm. But did um, we really deal with them? No, but and is it really easy? No. Um, yeah. So that really right there was just, I mean, that, that was definitely a, a, a whole moment. Thing. Okay. All right. So we're actually, I was going to transition us to takeaways. Let me also say though, we started this conversation. We knew we weren't going to get through it. We started it. Everybody's still in one piece. Um, <sighs> I encourage you to come back to this conversation. I think the other thing is sometimes we put this pressure that when we have these conversations that they are a quote failure if we don't get all the way to the end with everyone's feathers unruffled. That's just bullshit. That is not how it works. When we've got this, especially something you've you've dug, I mean that you've dug a hole and buried it, you know, you're going to get blisters on your hands as you use that shovel to start digging it out. Stop. Don't like take your hands to the bloody nubs. Like dig on it a little while and then put it to rest for a little while. This is as much as we needed to get through tonight. It's just plenty. Right. And then be able to come back. And so then you don't, maybe you don't have quite as much um, of an adverse reaction or adverse um, reaction to the idea of coming back to it because you haven't bloodied yourself in having the conversation, have this in small chunks. As soon as it gets too defensive or too adolescent or too, like you're about to bonk each other, whew, stop it. I think that we've worked on that this year. We have worked, we on, have worked on that. 
Good. Because we were I getting like really far deep into it every time, and it was getting just too intense. Like, yes. For both of us, because he doesn't like conflict, and I live for conflict. <laughs> so I feel like conflict is how you get to the meat of it and then move through it. And he feels like conflict should be completely avoided at all costs. Yeah. So we were not, our communication styles were not meshing very well. I'll also mention with the relationship boot camp that I gifted you guys, make sure you listen to that module about um, questioning and rethinking conflict. That was a game changer for us. Um, my husband was quite um, conflict avoidant too, and helping us to reframe that conflict is actually how we find deep connection. Um, and then why we avoid it, that ge- that was game changer for us. So I definitely will we'll put that as a follow-up um, for you guys. All right. Any other takeaways? The, the word easy was one for you, Casey. Any others? For me. Um, I guess I don't really know if I have any takeaways yet. Okay. <laughs> kind of in it still. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, maybe we'll come back after we do feedback and you can share a feed, uh, uh, takeaway then. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Rolling with thank it. You. Sometimes it is really hard to predict where we're going to go. Um, and I think we went a little over, but um, again, we, we, did. we started that conversation. <laughs> I, I appreciate everything. Yeah. Uh, the opportunity. So thank you. Sure, of course. Um, okay. So again, we're going to give everybody a chance to give you feedback. We're going to come back. You're going to report on what it was like to be on the hot seat and, rep- and then report on the, f- what it was feel- like, felt like to get their feedback. And Laura, you're on the hook for a takeaway. All right. So let me do this Brady Bunch style. How about if I call out, can I do that? Let's see. i um, seeing some nods. Amanda says I can, so I'm going to make her go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, first of all, after going on the hot seat last week, I have a true new appreciation for your vulnerability and willingness to share. So th- thank you for, for doing that. Um, and wanted to say first to start off so I don't forget, you know, um, Laura, at the beginning, what you said about um, non-monogamy, it was just so beautiful to me. And just the fact that, you know, you pointed out for you, it, it's, it's more of like this road. It's not about all the parties in Cancun. It's about becoming this whole person, um, you know, and showing up. And, and I just thought that was, that was beautifully said. Um, and I also, uh, <laughs> understand your experience with being on the dating apps and that frustration of feeling like you're putting yourself out there and being inundated with people that want to, you know, talk to you and, and your partner not necessarily having those many connections. And, and it it just brings up this whole roller coaster, you know, of emotions, you feel bad, but then you feel good. And, you know, you, you want to fix it for the other person and all kinds of things. But the one thing that I did hear, you know, for me, words of affirmation are, are hard anyways. They feel kind of superficial. Um, but then, you know, Casey, as you're talking about wanting to hide, like, you know, some of your interactions with other people on these apps, um, it just, it, 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 I could hear the opportunity for Laura, I think, to give you some of those words of affirmation that you're looking for. You know, I know for me, when I see David kind of reach out and, you know, he says some kind of corny line that doesn't land or something, you know, for me, it makes me love him even more. I'm sitting there and it's just like, oh my God, he's so cute. And this woman is just, you know, she's not, you know, picking up on it. And, and it gives me, you know, the opportunity to kind of show him how cute and cool that I think he is. So, you know, I just thought maybe that could be a, a place for you, but I'll start talking now. Great, Amanda. Thanks. Um, you know, thank you both. Um, I, you know, I think Amanda points out that the, the, the the relationship framework does give such a great opportunity to communicate and it is challenging when you're in a period, um, whether it's from the pandemic or, or whatever, I, I can feel that loss that you feel from that loss of communication. And I remember Laura, you bringing it up, I think a few weeks ago. And I, I remember that resonating then as well. Um, and, and I, Casey, I, I, um, can feel, um, the feelings that, that you're sharing around insecurity and 
know how um, how hard that can be um, and sort of how detrimental it is to your own um, image of yourself and, and what you're putting out there. And so um, thank you for sharing that. And um, it's good to know that, that uh, we're not the only ones who have fine life to be a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Thank you. David. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, David. Oh, Jill, are you uh, playing with your hair? Are you raising your hand? I'm being coy. <laughs> All right. Well, that's your coy on the feedback seat. <laughs> um, okay, fine. Uh, Laura and Casey, thank you for being super honest and vulnerable and just, you know, toasting your buns there on that seat for like, like you did. Um, codependency. That is, I don't know. It's, it's just something epic, but I know in Jack and I's life, like once the light bulb went on and thank you to Catherine for her incredible analogies of the boathouse. And I don't know, she gave us some other ones too. Like I've talked with lots of other people who struggle with it for years. And it was like, Catherine just, she turned that light bulb on for us and we just started walking. <laughs> and I think you guys are on, you have that same light bulb turned on and man, it makes life better when we each keep our own side of the street clean. Tell you what, it's changed things for us. So, um, yeah. And I just, I love listening to both of your stories, both of your, both of your walks. I resonated with it. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Yeah. Laura and Casey, um, first of all, thank you so much for just going, playing at 110%, um, putting difficult stuff out there. Uh, that's where the good stuff happens. And it may feel shitty right now. It may feel like it's been shitty for a while or whatever. But um, the one thing, <clears throat> Carl Jung has a quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Mm -hmm. um, and what I heard both of you do tonight is you're, you're bringing the unconscious into the conscious. And it feels really scary. You know, Casey, I really resonated with, with the easy part. We think it's easy because it's the, it's the devil we know. <laughs> um, it's not actually easy, but it's, it's the, it's the struggle that we know and we know how to get up and attack it the same way every day. And I don't see you, either one of you as being okay with that. Um, Casey, I resonate a lot with you and I, Laura, I do with you too. Um, you know, my, I was just reading back on, in my diary from last January and I was in the midst of it. We were in the midst of our struggle and talking with Catherine and all that. And just some of the things that I was writing in my diary at that point. And, you know, it was, I was so focused on this non-monogamy portion and, and all the good things it was bringing to us. And, you know, was I going to have to leave that, let that go for the sake of a relationship? And did I even want to, if that's what a relationship is going to look like? Um, but, but Casey, I, I really resonate with you. Um, I'm trying to find the line between power of witness and advice here. So <laughs> if, I, if I don't make that line, but um, what I've, what I've realized in the last six, eight months is that my context, my way of being the way I approach life was that I was trying to, make it all okay and make Jill happy. And I was totally not even thinking about myself. It was easier. Okay. Air quotes don't work well on a podcast. It was air quotes easier to put her needs or her happiness in front of my own and to not think about my own happiness. But it wasn't, it was until I stared that monster in the face of, you know, what does, what's Jack want here? How would Jack 
approach dating. How would Jack do this? Um, and to sit in that uncomfortableness and holy hell, was it ever uncomfortable? And it still is, but I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. Um, Catherine has a book club going on right now called No More Mr. Nice Guy. And that book changed my life. I'll just leave that there. Yeah, I was going to, I actually wrote that in the follow-up resources is uh, to share that book, No More Mr. Nice Guy with you. Um, thank you. And I am here. I like, I will share my contact info with, with both of you. We're here. We're here. We're not, we're not done just because we're on a podcast together. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Yeah, you can definitely do some contacting through MeWe and, and our group. Um, yeah. Thank you both for sharing that and your personal journeys um, as part of your reflection. Uh, Bill and Felice, you ready? Yeah. Um, let me just start off with saying, wow. Just to have that conversation here tonight like you did is just, just beautiful, brave, vulnerable, Um uh, so impressed that that you you know step forward and did that uh, for both of you. Um, you know, I think um, Felice and I have been there. Yeah, it, it reminded us exactly. Of, yeah, of we're almost, like, oh my god, it's yeah. like almost oh, precisely god. something that we went through. The same feelings. Um, you know, so I don't want to project too much on to either one of you, but you know, we've had the same. The, you know. The same feelings of insecurities that Casey talked about, I could feel, you know, and the, you know, the male female dynamic on these, on the dating apps and, uh, you know, that just amplifies those insecurities. It's like a megaphone on those insecurities. You just feel like, Oh my God, <laughs> she, she's just got everybody and I've got nobody. What, you know, what do I do? And, um, you know, it, it just, you know, it, your, your reaction is completely natural. And, um, you know, there was so much that you talked about that, um, you know, that I personally felt the, the bearing is something that I've done for, for a lot of my life uh, on a lot of different things. Um, you know, Jack is kind of the hard, easy part, you know, that the easiest thing sometimes seems just to stay the course, keep doing what you're doing, just keep, you know, keep on keeping on. But it actually, you know, it, it it can be hard because it comes up to bite you in the end. Um, anyway, you, just the whole thing, everything you talked about, the codependency and the way the dynamic between you um, just really related and really felt. Um, it, it really gave us a lot of things to think about, a lot of things to chew on. Um, and we're so appreciative for you to share and, and give us you know, your experience, um, as, as something to help us think about. And, uh, you know, you've got kinship and you've got brothers and sisters here who are going through <laughs> the same things. So, thank you. you know, thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Please, anything um, you want to add? Well, when Casey talks about being an imposter, I, I read, um, Cheryl Sandberg's book, uh, years ago, and I about feeling like an imposter, and like somebody's going to find you out and go, "You're not the person you are pretending to be." Mm-hmm. You know, I feel that uh, a lot more at work than I do at home or in the lifestyle, because you know I'm trying to be myself in the lifestyle, and I want people to want me for who I am. Mm-hmm. Um. But I do, I do find that uh, problematic, and there's a sense of hiding that you do, um, and you don't let people in because you fear they're going to find you out. So I get that. I really, I really resonate with that. And you know, like Bill said, we've we've been through this um, exactly what you guys are going through. So um, just push each other to communicate. I know that's. <laughs> that's but that's how we <laughs> got through it and and just it's hard I know it's hard but it's you guys are so brave to dig as Catherine said you know dig at it a little bit 
And Bill's a pusher, so we always have to, we always had to communicate. So, um, yeah, hang in there. It's going to get better. Thank you so much. I also want to mention having a pusher of a conversation and a, and a, a not pusher of a conversation in my dynamic with my husband, we made it safe for him to be like, okay, I'm saturated. That's all I got. Cause I mean, can you imagine how long I could talk about relationships? <laughs> like there's hardly an end, you know? And, but it, he, he was, and he would get scared about even starting the conversation because he knew that he didn't have the stamina for that, that I did. And so once we built that in to make it like, Okay. And he'd be like, okay, I think I got, I think I got enough for like one more question. And I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> and I know like which ones are going to be right. But that it didn't, I didn't have to take that personally. It didn't mean anything bad about the relationship. It was just a difference in our stamina. So throw that out there too. All right. Feminine. Fem, 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 fem. <laughs> <laughs> Emma and Finn, would you like to go next? <laughs> I just want to say that your bravery tonight was very impactful for me. Um, how vulnerable both of you were and open. Um, I feel like I have so much to say uh, and so much to reflect on. So thank you both for, for, for doing this, for, for putting out, being able to put this all out there. Uh, it's not easy and it's, it's hard work. And there's a few things I'll touch on that I could relate to. Well, a lot of it I could relate to. I see a lot of myself in both of you in different instances. Um, but I also really loved Laura at the beginning, like what you said, non-monogamy kind of meant to you. And I see that a lot in myself too, of why I push myself through some of the hard stuff, because I ultimately know that it's, it's uh it's worth it and it's true because it's it feels beautiful and true to me and so it's worth the hard things um I resonate with you Casey when you said at one point a fear of losing her even though that feels irrational I have that fear too and it does feel irrational <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's not there um and figuring out how to communicate and and for me, like figuring out my, my wants and needs to try to, to make that, um, not be as high of a fear, I guess. Um, and I think the other thing I, another thing I resonated with was it's the insecurities and the, it's scary to deal with your imperfections. We're all imperfect, imperfect in different ways. And, and it's really scary to, to, to acknowledge that and work through them and deal with it. But ultimately um, the people that mean the most to you will show up and support you through that. And uh, it's worth it. Um, I also related to when you said like the miscommunication, we've had that too. And trying to figure out how to get on the same page when you just don't feel on the same page. And it just takes work and time and effort and space and yeah. Um, and then one last thing I'll share the comment about, I think Catherine, you actually said this, but like the, am I worthy of, of whatever that gets back to, for me, like just negative self-talk and it's not most days. It's like not there. But some days it really is there and, and that's okay. And I, I think for me realizing that it's okay to have those days where you're not okay and, and to work through those things. Um, so I just, that so many things that I reflect on and that's just some of them. So thank you again for being brave and vulnerable and, and being here and showing up tonight. Thank you. Emma. Your turn before I get too emotional. <laughs> yeah, no, I again, like everybody said, thank you both for being here um, and for sharing everything. I think one of my favorite moments was uh, Laura ripping into Casey, <laughs> relatively speaking, about everything that happened on the the night 
we'll call it the night. Um, <laughs> and then at the end of it, Casey's like, well, and let's be clear. That wasn't the first time I fucked it up. And when you started that sentence, I was like, well, he's going to fight back here. And then he's just like, no, no, yeah, I, I fucked it up then. And I did it before. And so I, I just, I, that to me was like the epitome of being vulnerable and, uh, and just like owning the shit. And, and I think that says a lot for both of you that you're in here owning the shit and you, yeah, you might not have it figured out yet, but none of us do. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. I think a couple of things that I really related to, I mean, the insecurities that, that, that Casey struggles with, I think those are huge, uh, for me as well. And, uh, it's interesting that I have on the flip side, <laughs> I relate a lot with Laura and not uh, until recently, not being good about giving compliments. Um, I think I always was of the mindset that like, well, I'm here every day and I row my boat over to your boathouse every day. So like, don't you get it? Like I think all of the things that I'm not saying, and I think that's not enough. Right. And, and so you have to, you have to show up and say the stuff, especially if somebody who's insecure and wants to hear the stuff. Right. And so it's kind of hypocritical in, in a lot of ways. So yeah, that, that was just something that I've really been working on myself and, and I really resonated with, um, there. He has made improvements. I'm just going to stick that in there. <laughs> it's gotten better. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there's just, yeah, so, so just, yeah, the, the vulnerability and, and the, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I could talk forever on it. I would say maybe the one, the one piece about the, um, I know we're not supposed to give advice, but I'll say this doesn't like, work. He's like, I'm going to break the, break the rules every time. So here I go. <laughs> what, what, what doesn't work when you're trying to convince your partner that you, they're safe and secure is saying uh, that if I was going to leave, I would have done it a long time ago. That's not a great way to go about that. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes in the heat of the moment, you're like, damn it. Like I'm here. I rode over here every day for the last 20 years. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to roll over here tomorrow and I'm going to roll over here in two days. And it's, and it's hard um, to convince somebody. So yeah, I just, you're in, you're in the struggle and we're in the struggle. All of us mm. are here with you. So I love how Finn found a way to, to still give it. I love it, but that's, it is actually a really good point because yeah. some, one thing that I'll throw out there is, you know, if the way that you, you know, like you're saying, Finn, like I've rode my boat every day. Like, isn't that enough? Like, why can't this, why can't you see it instead of like being frustrated that they can't see it? It's like, wait, flip it around and say, I have all this love that I've put into rowing my boat over here and showing up. It's not landing. So how can I do it in a different way? Because it can feel really frustrating if we're putting all this effort and it's not being noticed. It's like, why don't we then channel our effort into a way that they can hear better? Um, so that's because it can, yeah. So you don't build the resentment about not your, your efforts not being noticed. Um, okay. Thank you for great feedback. So I went in. Emma and Ben. <laughs> All right, Laura, Casey, let's start with a uh, takeaway, Laura, if you've got one. I mean, I know it's like the last thing that I just heard, but um, trying to find a way to make it what I'm doing every day, like, like noticed. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the way that I have been showing him that I'm here and that our relationship is stable and solid. He already said I was going to be a mess. It's true. I cry all the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Is not really working. I mean, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not working. So, I I have been trying to explore with him, like, what that looks like to him. What does a stable, solid, good relationship look like so that I can at least see what he needs? Mm -hmm. But we're not really there yet to be able to, like, verbalize that or understand it. So I think we just need to do more work on kind of what, what we need to feel stable and solid. I think I started this with that, like, hey, I'm, I feel like we have a great relationship. It's not working so good right now, but I need to figure out a different way to 
I guess, navigate that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I noted those. I wrote that down in your notes. So if you'll each re- report on what it felt like to be on the hot seat and how it felt to get feedback. Um, you guys heard that? <laughs> you saw that? Um, I feel more vulnerable now after hearing um, people's takeaways and um, reflections or whatever you want to call that. Um, yeah, it was really, it's, it was nice that a lot of people listened, um, and it seemed like absorbed, um, information, which is always nice. It was nice to see, um, you know, that bring emotions, um, but it was also hard because I feel, you know, now of course with my insecurities, I, I feel like people are like, oh my gosh, these people are a wreck and trying to give it like, they want to give us so much feedback. Um, but yeah, it's nice because I think being vulnerable and, 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 you know, to, to just these, what is there like eight or nine of us, um, you know, to be able to do that to, I don't know how many listeners you guys have, but five or six at least. No. Um, it is really pow- it could be really powerful um so i i feel good but very more vulnerable now than i did when it was just the three of us mm-hmm. yeah yeah and i'll just point out that same tendency to take um we hear you we struggle to there's so much that we see in our of ourselves in you and turn it toward us believing that we all think you're that you're a hot mess so again, I say that with, with loving truth that, you know, if we, you know, if we shine that light on how that's just such the auto tendency, then maybe we start to notice the pattern and, and can start to shift it. Well, and I, and I know this is already way longer than it should be, but, but I think what I feel, what we feel is, is felt in so many people. But it's just mm-hmm. not talking about. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you guys so are brave enough to, to do it. Like non-monogamy to bring to normalize, um, you know, these issues, um, is pretty critical. So thank Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you for putting it out there. All right. Um, Laura, how about for you, how it felt to be on the hot seat and and get the feedback? The hot seat felt fine. I don't like have a lot of, like, I don't mind sharing and being vulnerable really. Like anybody could talk to me and I'm happy to talk to them. Um, the, Feedback feels good because I like, I, I, I can't say I like to hear that we're normal, but I like to hear that we're normal Mm -hmm. because I feel sometimes isolated in the just us, you know, and sometimes you can kind of see the just us, the just the two people in the relationship and not know that there may be other people kind of managing or dealing with the same types of things and feel like, man, am I just so crazy that this is an issue? (laughs) You know, because people don't really talk about it or bring it up or say, Hey, this is a problem in my relationship too. You know? So I really like the feedback. So thank you everybody for giving that to us. Great. Thank you all. All right. Um, let's wrap it up for tonight and we'll come back one more time to share, um, reflections and wrap up and we will, um, I'll be in touch this week, um, with what to expect with that. So you can all do a little preparation and, uh, we'll see you soon. I just really quick wanted to say Catherine and, and to Casey that don't worry about how long we win. If I was going to hang up on you, it would have been a long time ago. So. <laughs> And we're back. Thank you again. I know we've said it a lot, but thank you again for Laura and Casey for showing up and being your true authentic selves and opening up to everyone on this episode. And thank you again to Catherine, of course, and everyone in the bleachers and that was witness and for all of the amazing feedback. Uh, This was our last hot seat episode. However, you're going to definitely want to stay tuned and listen to the episode on the takeaways that is coming up next Friday. Yes, please hang with us. Don't don't be tempted to think you've gotten all the goody and that this is just going to be a bunch of rep- repetitive wrap up. There is there are some real gems in, in the next session. So please stick with us. Yeah. Yeah. I you, you both said it so well. If you're looking for uh, 
links to any of the things that we talked about there in the show notes, as well as how to learn more about joining one of these future cohorts of Power Witness with Catherine. Uh, again, not publicly, not on our podcast, but uh, privately. Uh, check out the show notes, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the resources tab and you will see a link for Power of Witness or just head down into your podcast app uh, show notes. And yeah. I think that's it. So Bye. we'll we'll see everybody in a week for the wrap up, wrap up episode. Wrap up episode. Sure. <laughs> take away, take away <laughs> episode. <laughs> yep. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening.